Hello and welcome to part two of our notes on the end of the war in unit eight. We're going to finish up this section and talk about how the Union gains control and eventually wins the Civil War. So one of the major strategies towards the end of the war was to get the Confederacy to eventually decide to give up and surrender. Um, Lincoln felt like he needed to do something to kind of break the will of the Confederacy because the people in the South um, were going to need to have a reason to actually um, want to end the war. So Union General William Tecumseh Sherman is given the order to drive his army, about 60,000 men, through the South to basically kind of divide the Confederacy into two geographical parts, but also to cause enough destruction to kind of make the South um, want to give up. This is called Sherman's March to the Sea. It happens primarily through Georgia. It's going to happen over about a five to six week period um, in November and December of 1864. And um, their orders are to, when they come to a field, if they come to a, uh, a railroad bridge, to just completely destroy it. Okay, So they are trying to make this so that the South really can't use any of these things in the path that Sherman is marching down through Georgia in. Um, so imagine essentially a 60 mile wide swath that's about 300 miles long. So if Sherman and his men come to a wheat field, for example, they'll burn it to the ground. If they come to a railroad bridge, they explode it and destroy the bridge. If they come to railroad tracks, as you can see in this picture here, um, they're supposed to destroy the tracks, okay? So they're not technically supposed to burn cities, although that does happen in some cases, but basically anything that the South or the Confederacy can use as a weapon of war, um, they're supposed to destroy. So I usually tend to tell students to think about almost like a, um, you know, an F4 or an F5 tornado that essentially is about 60 miles wide and about 300 miles long. So when you look at the amount of damage that was done by Sherman on the March to the Sea, they estimate that in today's dollars, it would be worth about $20 billion of damage that was done to this part of Georgia. Okay, so they're trying to force the South to understand that there's really not going to be an option for them to win and that they're going to need to surrender. Otherwise, it's not just going to be Sherman's march to the sea. It's going to be even larger sections of the South that are destroyed like this. So here's a map that kind of shows you where we're at, um, kind of down through Georgia. Um, they go through Atlanta, down into Savannah. Once they get to Savannah, they start to march up through South Carolina and eventually up into North Carolina. So this is kind of roughly where Sherman's March to the Sea is going to take place. And here's some pictures that kind of show some of the damage that's done in the South by some of the bombardment. Um, these are American cities. It almost looks like a World War II picture in uh, Europe, but this is actually American cities in the Civil War. And one of the things that Sherman's men do when they come to railroad ties is they take the actual piece of steel that makes up the rail the railroad line and they heat it up so that it's kind of like soft enough to bend and then they wrap it around trees and they're called these Sherman neckties. Um, essentially what the Union troops are doing is they're making these so that they would have to be completely remade into railroad lines. So if you just kind of disassemble the railroad line and kind of put it off to the side, it wouldn't take a ton of work to just line it back up again. They want to make it so that the South is going to have to completely rebuild everything from scratch. So here's an example of what they called Sherman's neckties. So while this is happening, there is an election. Um, even though the Civil War is happening, every four years there is a presidential election. Lincoln won the first uh, presidential election of his in 1860. There's another election in 1864. Uh, if you remember back in the notes, we talked about George McClellan is actually the person that he runs against in 1864. Um, Abraham Lincoln is a Republican. McClellan is a Democrat. One of the things that's kind of central to this election is Lincoln is saying that he wants to finish out the war, wants to win the war with the South. McClellan is saying he wouldn't mind necessarily maybe making a peace treaty with the South and ending the war that way. Um, Lincoln does win. I believe he gets about 55% of the popular vote, 
Remember, there's no votes, obviously, in the Confederate states. But Lincoln wins 55% of the overall vote. McClellan wins about 45 In the Electoral College, though, it's not even close. Lincoln wins almost all the Electoral College votes um, in the election of 1864. So Lincoln is reelected for a second term. So the South begins to realize in 1865 that there really is no path for them to eventually be able to win. They've got um, just huge numbers of losses. Um, they're not able to replenish their army. Uh, most of the fighting is happening in the South, and it's causing massive damage in the South. So Lee is going to make the decision to uh, surrender to General Grant, and that happens at a place called Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, on April 9th. 1865. So um, this is the kind of unofficial end of the war. It's not technically the end of the war. Lee is going to surrender most of the Confederate troops. There are a few battles that happen after this, but for all general purposes, this is the end of the Civil War. Um, and it's kind of a funky name for a town, Appomattox Courthouse, but that's the name of the town in Virginia where this officially takes place. And um, this is the house where the surrender papers are signed. Um, so Grant and Lee are going to meet in this house. And there's kind of an interesting story about this house. The person that owns this house where they signed the treat peace treaty papers at is actually somebody that moved from Manassas, Virginia. It was a guy that had a farm that had actually been hit with bullets and stuff during the first battle of the war, the first major battle of the war, um, the Battle of Bull Run. He decided to move his family from that part of Virginia to what he believed would be a quieter place. And his house is the one that they've actually used to sign the, the treaty to end the war. So he could technically say that the war started in his front yard and it ended in his living room. It's kind of an interesting story. So here's a painting of what it looked like when Lee, over in gray here, is surrendering to uh, General Grant of the Union. So this is an interesting situation. This is a civil war. So um, you've got a lot of Confederate troops that are now officially um, defeated. Um, the Union can handle this, you know, in a variety of ways, either be super harsh and punitive uh, to the Confederate troops or, you know, kind of like be a little bit gracious and allow them a little bit of dignity. Um, Grant is really uh, big on telling his, his men that we're not going to like immediately punish these men. Um, the Confederate soldiers are given food, which many of them um, were, were hungry and they hadn't had supplies for a while. And basically they're allowed to go back home to their families. So with that, the war that had lasted roughly four years is finally over. Um, it had been much, much longer than most people anticipated, much higher casualty rates. And now Lincoln has the task of trying to heal both sides um, of this vicious war. So a lot of times when we talk about a major war, like, you know, World War One, World War Two, there's a victor and there's a loser. And in many cases, um, the victor gets to dictate a lot of the terms as to how the loser is going to maybe redo their government or what their economy is going to look like. Lincoln, after fighting a war for four years and having to convince the South to eventually give up and surrender, now his task is to try and heal that country and put them back together. And that's going to be extremely difficult. So in many ways, what Lincoln has to do after the war is going to be even more of a challenge than winning the war itself. Um, the Civil War, by far, is still the deadliest war in American history. And um, when we look at our notes um, in the next section on the legacy of the war, we'll talk a little bit about the aftermath and look at some numbers. Um, but just the sheer loss that happened economically and loss of life during the Civil War um, is just is going to be overwhelming. All right. So that is part two of our notes on the end of the war. We have one section left, and we'll talk about the legacy of the war in our last section. Thanks, guys.